continuing, Energy and Atmosphere, Lead Version 3, EA Credit 2, On-Site Renewable Energy is the second most heavily weighted credit in the Lead Version 3 2009 rating system for new construction. 1% on-site renewable energy production gets you one point and similar to optimized energy performance for 2% increase in on-site renewable energy gets you one more point all the way up to 13% on-site renewable energy production achieving seven points with the opportunity for an exemplary performance point totaling eight points if 15% your total annual energy cost is produced by on-site renewable energy. For corn shell, 1% on-site renewable energy equals 4 points and 5% gets you an ID point. Examples of renewable energy are expansive, but in general, what Lee considers renewable energy would be solar thermal systems, photovoltaic or PV systems, these can come in thin film or nanotechnology. Important to consider integrated type of panels like you see on your right with roofing systems. Uh, weight can be an issue, so sometimes a thin film just rolling on can help disperse the weight, easy install, and you don't have to worry about structural upgrades, especially for existing building, although it does take more surface area to produce the same amount of electricity in most cases. There's also wind turbines as you see in the diagram it's a double helix shaped wind turbine geothermal heating and electric biofuel based systems although not all biofuel based systems count wave and tidal power systems are included and low impact hydroelectric is also included in the lead rain system non eligible examples are architectural features passive solar daylighting systems and geo exchange which would be a ground source heat pump and the reason for that is it's not actually producing electricity so don't be tricked on the test by things that are passive systems that are good for optimizing energy efficiency but don't count towards on-site renewable energy so make sure that you place those in the right credit when it's included in the question here's an example of Innovative integration of renewable energy. This is a tower in designed to be in Dubai, but actually there are prototypes planned around the world for this. It's actually a rotating building with wind power turbines horizontal in between each floor. So it actually is prefabricated per floor and then put on a central core. Very interesting prototype. I hope to see more things like this around the world. Benefits of on-site renewable energy, especially for rural communities, is being self-sustaining. This is good for security as a country or just as your own home to be able to self-sustain. The Department of Energy has a Wind Powering America initiative, and these things are constantly evolving. Basically, moving this direction can help us reduce our air and water consumption, which helps with the longevity of our resources. Rebates and incentives can curb costs, so check for local and state rebates and incentive programs. There are many synergies with related credits, including fundamental commissioning. You want to make sure to check the installation and commission any renewable energy technology on site or on your building, minimum energy performance, optimize energy performance, interrelate with renewable energy because the more efficient your building is, the more electricity produced with on site renewable energy will actually count as a percentage of your annual energy costs. So it's either easier to hit something like 10% on site renewable energy when you have a very efficient building to start with. Implementation, you want to consider life cycle cost analysis of potential savings and incentives in your particular state. Contact local utility or electric service providers to determine whether net metering is available. 
On-site renewable energy should be based on either the metered renewable energy produced and used on-site or the metered renewable energy produced and used on-site or sent to the grid. And once, that, once again, that pertains to the net metering possibilities. You have to consider regional variations in your decisions about renewable energy. Some locations have better wind production, so using a wind turbine makes more sense. And some regions have better solar access, and this can pertain to your particular site. You want to make sure to do a solar analysis of how much access you have due to trees as well on your site. And then just your local climate data. One thing to consider with PV panels in most cases, if part of the PV array is shaded, that actually inhibits PV production of the whole array. So it's really important to do these type of studies. EA Credit 3, Enhanced Commissioning, builds on the fundamental commissioning prerequisite mandatory for all lead projects. You can earn two points by satisfying these requirements. You have to do the additional activities on top of prerequisite one, including conduct a commissioning design review, review contractor submittals applicable to systems being commissioned, develop a systems manual, verify that requirements for training are completed for facility staff, and review the building 10 months after substantial completion. This is one of the few times that there is a requirement after the building is constructed for lead new construction. It's important to memorize the commissioning tasks for both fundamental commissioning for the prerequisite and enhanced commissioning and knowing the difference between the two. So this chart shows us the requirements mandatory for all lead projects from the fundamental commissioning prerequisite one. You need to designate a commissioning authority, document owner's project requirements, develop a basis of design, incorporate commissioning requirements into the construction documents, develop and implement a commissioning plan, verify the installation and performance of commission systems that needs to be done by the commissioning agent, and complete a summary commissioning report also done by the commissioning agent. See there are options for the team and owner to be involved in the other tasks. These commissioning tasks are required for the enhanced commissioning credit. You need to conduct commissioning design review prior to mid-construction documents. So it's important to assign the commissioning agent as soon as possible to not miss that landmark. Review contractor submittals applicable to systems being commissioned, also done by the commission agent. And develop a systems manual for the commission systems. This can include the project team. Verify that the requirements for training are completed and review building operation within 10 months after substantial completion. So there's the difference between the fundamental commissioning prerequisite and the additional enhanced commissioning requirements. And it's important to know the difference between the two for the test. It's important to understand the criteria for the commissioning authority as well. They need to have experience in at least two buildings, be independent of the project's design and construction management, though they may be employees of the firm providing those services. And there is an exception for projects less than 50,000 square feet that the commissioning agent may include qualified persons on the design or construction team. So remember that exception for projects less than 50,000 square feet. Those are the type of details they can ask you questions about on the Lead AP Plus exam. They must also report results and recommendations directly to the owner. And they may be a qualified staff member of the owner or an owner's consultant. It's just important that they stay as third party as possible to make sure that they are reviewing the systems from outside eye. That's really where you get the best value. The criteria for the commissioning authority for EA Credit 3 enhanced commissioning to earn those two points are slightly more stringent. You also need to have experience in at least two buildings, but they cannot be an employee of the design firm, which is different than the prerequisite, though they may be contracted through them. And they cannot be an employee of or contracted through a contractor or construction manager holding construction contracts. 
So once again, that's kind of the fox watching the hen house, not a good idea. And there's no exception for project size for the credit criteria for the commissioning authority. Once again, they need to report results and recommendations directly to the owner, and they may be a qualified staff member of the owner or an owner's consultant. This is really the recommended path. Documentation for this credit include updating the commission plan as each milestone is reached, verify the commissioning authority has experience in a lease to other buildings, include copies of the commissioning authority design review, any designer responses to the review and confirmation of back check, owner's project requirements, the basis of design, any commissioning specifications, the commissioning report, and building operator training manual and schedule. So this is heavy on documentation. So make sure that the team understands these requirements and works with the commissioning authority. And you have a commissioning authority that is good with attention to detail and is thorough to make sure you achieve these two points when you're going for enhanced commissioning. EA Credit 4, Enhanced Refrigerant Management. For new construction, you get two points. Schools, one point. Corn shell, two points are possible. Option one to earn this credit is do not use refrigerants. That's the easiest way. A naturally ventilated building, for example, would automatically earn this credit. So any building that doesn't have any active cooling automatically receives this credit. As you can see in the facade on the image, that can be done through a really integrated design in the facade itself. There are many louvers and automatic controls in this facade to help it achieve natural ventilation. Note that HVAC units and any other equipment holding less than a half a pound of coolant is not subject to this credit criteria. So individual refrigerators are exempt. EA credit for enhanced refrigerant management can also be achieved through another option which requires a calculation of the base building HVAC and refrigerant equipment that calculates the ozone depletion potential and global warming potential. As remember the two factors we're concerned about in the fundamental refrigerant management prerequisite. The equation as you can see looks complicated but it's most important to understand the principle behind it. If you're looking at life cycle ozone depletion potential plus life cycle global warming potential times 10 to the fifth power having to be less than a hundred you know very 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 little is actually acceptable also note the metric is expressed as pounds of CO2 per ton per year for life cycle ozone depletion potential and for life cycle direct global warming potential expressed as pounds of CFC 11 per ton per year CFC 11 being one of the worst refrigerants for global warming potential. Strategies include not using refrigerants or refrigerants that cause less atmospheric damage such as natural refrigerants. Minimize coolant leaks by running at low or negative pressure in your equipment. Equipment that uses coolants efficiently compared to its gross cooling capacity has less potential to damage the atmosphere. So look for very efficient cooling equipment. And choose fire suppression equipment that does not use halons, CFCs, and HCFCs. So it's important to note that fire suppression is also included in this credit criteria. There are calculation requirements for this credit. You need to obtain the following data for each base building, HVAC, and refrigerant unit, including the refrigerant charge, expressed as pounds of refrigerant per tons of gross cooling capacity, the refrigerant type, which determines the ozone depletion potential and global warming potential, and the equipment type. Documentation includes any base building system using refrigerants. You need to provide the manufacturer's data stating the refrigerant types and quantities used and provide manufacturer or engineering data proving that fire suppression systems are free of halons, CFCs, and HCFCs. Fred Myers in Portland 
is a good case study for innovative refrigeration. Their store on Hawthorne was a prototype. They tested out some innovative refrigeration systems and even captured Stormwater reused it as part of the HVAC system. They also did things for water conservation such as low flow toilets, sinks, and faucets, totaling a water use reduction of 40%. And for energy efficiency, lights at the cake counter will only turn on when a customer walks past. And looking at life cycle cost savings, the extra features including the innovative refrigeration system will cost $275,000, which was about 2% of the construction costs. And once the remodel is done, they expected to cut costs by $250,000 a year. And it has been completed at this time. And from what I hear from their corporate staff is they're very pleased with the results and may have even exceeded this goal. Therefore, you're going to see many retrofits to Fred Myers around the country, really getting future ready. So as energy costs go up, they're going to keep profitable. Something like the food market, you really see these results, especially on a large scale. EA Credit 5, measurement and verification, heavily weighted, new construction, three points possible, schools two points, and it does not apply to corn shell projects. The requirement is to develop and implement a measurement and verification plan consistent with either option one, which is Calibrated simulation, option D. It's a saving estimation method. Or option two to earn this credit is energy conservation measure isolation, which is option B. Those option D and Bs actually refer to the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol, IPMVP. So remember, standards are something you have to memorize for the test. So for this standard, the acronym can help you remember it because MV is right in the standard's name. So the requirements are an M and V period that is at least one year post-occupancy. So once again, this is one of the few credits that actually includes requirements post-building occupancy. If you find problems with the measure and verification process, you need to provide corrective action plans and actually implement those plans that are low cost. Option D, the calibrated simulation saving estimation method addresses M and V of the whole building. It's commonly used for more complex or interactive systems. Those are often more of the smart building types. It can use a baseline for EA Credit 1 optimized energy performance if you have an energy model that could possibly be hooked to a DDC system or some sort of central control. It can be achieved by adjusting the as-built simulation to reflect actual operating conditions. Option B, energy conservation measure, ECM isolation. This is more typical for smaller or simpler buildings because it's isolating the main energy systems and applying it on an individual unit basis. This would be very hard for a large complex building system. The measurement and verification plan needs to include a description of the infrastructure design, existing meter locations, existing meter specifications, a one-line electrical schematic identifying in-use circuits, and guidelines for carrying out tenant submetering. This is applicable to corn shell projects as well. For corn shell projects, tenant submetering can earn three points. Requirements include an expandable centrally monitored electronic metering network in the base building design. The network must permit expansion for future tenant submetering under the terms of LEED 2009 for commercial interiors EA Credit 3 measurement and verification. Some metering can be a good method for actually getting tenants to be more engaged with their building and help with energy efficiency in their habits and how they use their space. Documentation includes a measurement verification plan for tenants that explains how to earn this LEED CI credit. 
this applies to corn shell projects, and determine a method of correcting any problems that the plan indicates expected energy savings is not being met. Here's an example of a submetering system. There are many wire mesh systems that you can actually install even after a building is complete and you can continue to update these things. Building control systems and integrated systems can really help the performance of a building by optimizing how your building is used based on tenant usage. It's important to also educate your facility staff about how to interact with these systems to use them to their best abilities.